Hi, I'm David Zyla, and welcome to episode eight of Feel Good Beauty. For other episodes, please visit my YouTube channel. So the question uh, I'm often asked is, what is Feel Good Beauty? And I wanna mention that I've, I've spent my career helping women feel like the best versions of themselves. And when it comes to feeling beautiful, I've discovered that it's not about chasing a trend, transforming yourself into an ideal, or even shifting one inch out of your comfort zone. Uh, instead, it's all about identifying and magnifying the unique individual and beautiful woman that you are. In this episode, I'm going to share some tips on dressing for a special occasion, organizing your kitchen to ensure a stress-free cooking experience with the no-nonsense home organization plan author, Kim Davidson Jones, how to apply makeup like a professional with be your own makeup artist, author Natalie Sedere, and building awareness around the mind and body with Pilates instructor and educator, Michelle Pritchard. So thank you. We've got a, some wonderful guests today and I'm, I'm very excited that you're joining us. So um, the first thing we're gonna talk about today is dressing for a special event. And uh, there are, I'm gonna go through several scenarios and to give you some tools on how to choose that, that correct thing to wear. Um, so right now, uh, uh, even though a lot of our activities are curr currently virtual and formality levels may be somewhat different, uh, the same philosophies of dressing for a special event are definitely still in place. So if we can go to the first slide. So what I wanna uh, mention is when we're dressing for a special event, it's very important to, next slide please, um, identify your role, define your role. You know, the, the beautiful dress or the really cool jumpsuit may look unbelievably good on you and be the right color and right fit and everything, but it may not be sending the right message for the specific occasion. Um, so you want to define your role. So obviously if you're the bride, it means one thing at a wedding as opposed to a guest. Um, are you, you know, are you the bride? Are you a guest? Are you the the date of a guest and have never met the birthday girl? Let's say um, these are all important factors in determining what is right, not just for the occasion, but for your role in the event. Um, and defining your role will make the shopping process much easier and you're gonna feel fantastic and you're gonna feel right um, as a result. If we could go to the next slide, please. So we're going to look at our true colors. So if you um, have been following me and, and watching other Feel Good Beauty, Beauty episodes, you've seen me go through the different um, uh, colors that are part of your personal palette. And so I call these your true colors. And these colors are found by looking at the colors found in your eyes, hair, and skin. And they create the most harmony when you wear them in your wardrobe. If we could go to the next slide. So let's talk about the bride. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So there's a tradition in Western culture to wear white to your wedding. Um, and if you want to do that traditional um, approach to it, um, what I would say is my best tip on choosing a white for you is to match the white that is the white of your eye. Um, and you will determine it. It's a very interesting thing there. Um, if you look very, very carefully, and I would say do this in a mirror, good natural light, um, maybe holding up some swatches from a paint fan deck is a good idea to look at different versions of white. And you will see there's a big difference between optic, cream, eggshell, Navajo white or vanilla, et cetera. Um, there are many, many shades and you want to find the one that's right for you because if it's already part of your coloring, it's going to be harmonious when you wear it. If, however, you don't want to go as traditional, 
um, and do something a little bit less expected and very, very beautiful, I suggest, if we could go to the next slide, uh, doing a dress in your essence color. And if you look at episode seven of Feel Good Beauty, I have a full set of instructions there on finding this color uh, for you. And in short, the essence color is your personal version of nude. And when a swatch of it is in the palm of your hand, all of the tones in the hand look very soft and very glowy. Um, and this is a, a beautiful alternative to white and will appear like a white on you. It will be very soft um, and quite, quite beautiful. If we could go to the next slide. Um, and here are just some examples of um, bridal wear uh, in essence colors. Um, and so uh, typically if you were doing a, a, if you were shopping for something like this online, you would look for colors like blush and apricot and cafe au lait and so on. Um, and anyway, a really, really lovely alternative um, to traditional whites. So if we could go to the next slide. So you're a guest. Um, so whether you're a guest at a wedding or another event, I want you to go back this, to this idea of defining your role in the festivities. So um, in most cases, um, if you're a guest at an event, you're, you're typically going to be supportive of someone who's you know, the star of the event, like the bride, uh, the person turning 50, et cetera. And therefore, if we could go to the next slide, I was, would suggest looking at wearing an energy or a tranquil color. Um, and so again, if you've been following me on Feel Good Beauty, you've seen videos on how to find all these colors. And if you look at episode one of Feel Good Beauty, yes, the very first one, uh, you'll see an episode on finding your energy and tranquil colors. And in short, the energy and the tranquil colors on the palette are the, uh, the energy is the darkest color found in the eye and in your iris. And the tranquil color is the lightest. And so the energy color is gonna be a very supportive color. It makes you look very friendly, very approachable. And the tranquil color is a color that um, makes you very supportive. Um, and really gives you a, uh, how would I say, it's almost like having a secondary role. It's, a, it's not forceful. Um, it's still very glowy and very beautiful to wear, um, but it definitely is like you're, you're playing a supporting character when you wear it. Um, and so these are two really, really good colors um, to use uh, when you are a guest. So if we could go to the next slide. And here are some examples. And this color literally could be anything from blue to a gray, to a brown, to an orange or a purple, literally anything you would find in an eye. Um, and if you look at episode one on how to discover it, uh, I encourage you there to um, look beyond brown and look beyond quote unquote blue um, and really look carefully at the colors found in your eyes to discover these colors. And they are fantastic um, to wear as a guest. So let's go to the next slide. What to wear for a date. Um, so for a date, you're really going to want to be um, your most romantic. And if we could go to the next slide. And so of course you should wear your romantic color. And in episode four of Feel Good Beauty, I give you the full instructions for finding this color. In short, uh, this is the color of your flushed skin. Um, it's the color that is the, uh, what you see when you pinch your fingertip. Um, and you, will, you can find this along with all of your true colors by using a paint fan deck and comparing and contrasting the colors. Um, and so this is, uh, the romantic color is, is the sexy color on the, on the palette. It's, it's the vivacious color. And again, it's your version of red. And um, so this is the perfect color for a date night look. And if we, we could go to the next slide. 
So it's going to be, um, remember, it's your version of red. So it literally could be any color that you find at a lipstick counter. Um, and I suggest you use it to the degree of formality that the date is. If it's a black tie event, it's a cocktail dress or a long dress. Um, if it's, you know, a, a, a a date, a lunch date, um, it might be a, a blouse or something like that. Um, but it is really a good color um, for any sort of romantic um, connection. So if we could go to the next slide. So remember when I spoke about uh, your role at an, in an event, um, at an event, I should say. Um, so if you're going to be honored, let's say you're the guest of honor, so it's your birthday, you got a promotion, et cetera, um, we're going to talk about what to wear for that. So if we could go to the next slide. So the color I suggest for, um, for your celebration, for your being the center of attention is, um, uh, you can find full instructions on finding this color in episode six. Um, this is the dramatic color. This is the big kaboom, look at me color. Um, it's, it's all about me color. Um, and it is found by looking at the vein in your wrist. And so this color is always going to be a blue, a green, or a purple. And just like finding all of your true colors, um, I want to remind you that when you are matching colors, whether it's your flushed skin, whether it's your iris, whether it's the ring around your eye, whether it's the wrist, uh, the vein in the wrist, um, you want to make sure that all the colors around it stay intact. So if all of a sudden you try uh, this color next to the vein, you say, well, I think I've matched it, but all of a sudden you're seeing shadows in your hand and maybe you're getting kind of some you know, golden yellow at the base of your thumb, which was never there before, you might want to rethink the color. The pig, some of the pigments in it might be right, um, but it's not, it's not spot on. A good color for you should not do create any damage whatsoever. In fact, a lot of my clients will say that when they wear their true colors, they will literally wear less makeup than when they're not. Um, because it gives them this extra glow. So the dramatic color, again, it's a blue, green, or a purple. Um, you can look for full instructions in episode six, if we could go to the next slide. And here are some examples of that. And so again, it's going to be a blue, a green, or a purple. Um, and when I say green, it could be everything from evergreen to pine to teal. Um, the purple could be aubergine, it could be um, royal, et cetera. So literally anything that's underneath these categories of color could potentially be that for you. So next, let's go to the next slide. So let's talk a, a little bit about holiday dressing. Um, it's very interesting that um, when I meet a client and they have a closet of all of the most absolutely fantastic clothes that really illuminate them in the best way. And then they might have a sweater or, or a dress or something that is nothing like the rest of their clothes that is reserved only for holiday. And I, I, I don't, how would I say? I don't like that idea because I feel every single day of the year, you should look like the best version of yourself. And so, um, so to get us away from saying, okay, well, it's this holiday, so I have to wear these colors or these styles. That's kind of the idea of going back to a, unif a, a uniform in a way. Um, like, oh, you know, so everyone knows I'm celebrating, I need to wear this. Um, I think there are alternatives to, um, uh, what you wear on these days. So I'm gonna give you um, some ideas on how we can celebrate the season. Uh, now, remember, we just discovered uh, how to find our romantic color and our dramatic color. These colors on your personal palette are the most powerful colors. They're very celebratory, they're very bold. Um, and so if you think about holiday colors, like let's say, you know, Christmas is thought of as red and green. Um, think about them in the same way. They're very like kaboom. They're very powerful. They're very festive. And so these are both really good colors, the dramatic color and the romantic color 
to use around the holiday, any holiday, really. Let's go to the next slide. And here are some wonderful examples um, of how you can wear your colors, but in a celebratory way. Um, one thing I would say is when it does come to the, let's say the winter holidays, adding a bit of sparkle is fun. So maybe you're wearing, you know, your colors, but in, a, you know, a little bit more sparkle, whether it's something sequined or metallic or lame or, or, or more jewelry or sparklier jewelry. Um, I also love some sheen, you know, a bit of satin, um, you know, this patent leather belt that I'm showing you here, the satin dress. I also love more luxe fabric. So you could definitely nod to the season with something that is in, you know, what we think of as a, you know, holiday fabric like velvet, like this great blazer here. I also would say that a bit more embellishment is a, is a really wonderful um, way to celebrate the holidays. So you'll notice this um, um, maroon dress um, has this fanciful hem to it, um, which is probably something you wouldn't wear to work, but that extra something makes it more festive, yet it's still a very simple dress in the end. Um, and then the purse here with both tassels and feathers on it, how fun is that? Um, so these are all ways where you can say, um, I'm part of the festivities, but you don't necessarily have to wear colors and styles that aren't A plus on you. My idea is that you are A plus uh, every single day of the year, including the holidays. So um, let's go to the next slide. So when all else fails, uh, many will reach for the LBD, also known as the little black dress. And um, I'm going to help you fine tune this. So if you say, you know, I don't go to a lot of special events, I, I, but I do want one thing in my closet that will help me out, you know, cover my bases, if you will. And um, this color um, that you're going to determine for yourself is going to be your version of black. This is going to be called the first base. Um, and if you look at episode five, I have an, uh, an episode on how to find the best neutrals for you. And in short, this color, if we could go to the next slide, um, is found by looking at the ring around your iris. Um, and this is something that you may want to take a photo of your eye for and blow it up. Again, going back to the idea of using a paint wand to discover these colors is a great idea. Um, and this is going to be a dark neutral. It's not necessarily going to be black. Um, and you'll see with this individual, um, I'm showing you this sort of uh, deep anthracite blue color. Um, it's like teal that we've added black to. Um, and so it has some blue and some green to it. Um, but yours could be espresso. It could be a really, really dark purple. Um, it could be navy. It could be um, literally any shade of uh, any shade of like mid to dark grays with green in them or blue in them or purple in them, et cetera. Um, oftentimes, believe it or not, this is the color that you've already discovered and you may not know it. Um, a lot of people I know will have this color in an eye pencil um, in their makeup kit already. So um, think about, if you've already chosen it as an eye pencil, think about using it in a bigger way. And this color is fantastic to, uh, use in a, you know, LBD or, you know, your LBD. And sometimes the LBD is not B, remember. Um, sometimes it's not black. Sometimes it's brown or blue. Um, so this is the color to use. And this would really suit that go-to dress that you could go to a cocktail party in or uh, festivity after work, whether it's in person, which we will get back to, um, or virtual for right now. So um, if we could go to the next slide. And here are some examples of that LBD. And it literally would be a simple dress in lines that suit you. And if you look at other Feel Good Beauty episodes, um, I reveal how to discover necklines, et cetera, that suit you. So that is how you dress for a special event. So now, I would like to introduce, oh, and here's how to follow me. So if you're interested in my books or how to follow me on social media, please do. 
Uh, so now I am going to introduce you to someone who is going to help us get organized. Um, we all need this. Uh, so let me introduce you to Kim Davidson Jones. Kim Davidson Jones is the founder of Lock and Key Home and author of the No Nonsense Home Organization Plan. She's been featured in several national publications to help others get organized, like todayshow.com, Bare Minerals, uh, Redfin, Kentucky Living. Living Magazine and many others. After having twins, her life, she qu quote, was turned upside down. She went from being a very organized person to barely keeping her head above water. After they turned one and a move, she decided something had to give and it did. Kim went from researching and practicing in her home, creating systems to maintain organization and switching the mindset around stuff to helping clients get organized and live a more simple, happier life. Kim, welcome. We're so happy to see you today. Well, I'm so happy to be here. Really appreciate you having me. Well, we um, today you're going to help us. I see where you are in, in the house. Uh, you're in the appropriate room and you're going to help us organize the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you would um, tell us first, you know, how, how do we start? You know, wh what's the first step? Yeah, so it's interesting because the kitchen is actually the best place to start. But the problem is people look at the kitchen as a whole and they just get automatically overwhelmed and shut down. So the best way to handle the kitchen is to break it into zones, small pieces, so that you can get it accomplished and then go to the next piece versus looking at the entire kitchen. So um, clean out your refrigerator. If you're ha having people over for Thanksgiving. You may as well have a clean, fresh refrigerator because you're going to have a lot of things that you need to put in there. Last thing you want is guests opening up your refrigerator, everything falling out on them. Um, so it's the perfect time to go through, get rid of anything that's expired. You would be surprised to find things in your refrigerator that expired five plus years ago. And you just never know because it gets pushed to the back. So Refrigerators are the great way to start. Um, anything that's very black and white, meaning it has an expiration date, is the best place to start. Um, but don't look at the refrigerator freezer together. Start small and just do the refrigerator one day, conquer it, and then the next day you'll do the freezer and you'll be surprised how much quicker and efficient you are because you've got it under your belt. That's great advice to do it in smaller pieces so you don't just throw up your hands and say, I can't do this. <laughs> Um, so would you say, is there, you know, I know with things like exercising, um, exercise experts will often say, you know, do this at this time of day, not that time of day. Do you have specifics around that with organization? Yeah, so um, I break it down into very small steps. So it'll take less than 30 minutes per day. So a lot of, you know, when you go to work all day and you're tired and, you know, the last thing you want to do is come home and organize the entire kitchen. But if you have in your mind just to take 30 minutes out of your evening, once you get home, maybe after you cook dinner and you're cleaning up and just do small pieces at a time, it works really well, especially if you already have that time period carved out and you're ready for it. And then the weekends, Saturday is a great time to maybe do something a little bit bigger of a project like a pantry. And that'll take, you know, maybe an hour to two, but you have your whole family home. You can be wearing your pajamas. You can be playing your music, drinking coffee, and you have more time on your hand to kind of enjoy the process. And if one has a family, do you think um, organizing the kitchen could be a, a family project? It can be. It's interesting, especially in the pantry, because I have the pantry, again, broken down into zones. So my kids are four, and they're getting to the point where they want independence, but I don't need to give them the entire world of independence. So I'll give them a smaller area or a lower shelf where they can go in and get the pantry, get their food, and take what they need. And they know where it's at because it's all categorized by their particular items versus, you know, maybe the baking items like the flour, I don't want them to necessarily have access to. So you can put that on the top. 
Um, but it can very much be a family affair, especially if you make it fun. Um, people, some people are like, my kids would never in a million years, but I will definitely get my kids in the kitchen, my husband in the kitchen, and we just kind of knock it out together. It's so much more fun when you're with other people too, and you're not stuck in the kitchen by yourself while everyone else is off doing something else. Um, Kim, what would you say is the biggest misconception around getting organized, specifically for a kitchen? The biggest misconception is that people think that they're not naturally organized and that it can never work. Another misconception is sometimes people will tidy. And so they'll go in and they'll put, you know, the cereal boxes in perfect order, or, you know, they'll kind of set up their forks in like perfect order, but they don't create a system that works for the entire family. So it will look like they did nothing within 24 hours. So the goal is really that you have to do the hard work up front and create a system that's going to work for your entire family. So a lot of times that means taking every single thing out of the space and evaluating every single item, which is also overwhelming for people who see more clutter and then they kind of shut down like I'm not getting anywhere but you just have to be laser focused and you have to prepare yourself to take everything out of the space, categorize it, and then go through every single item and really decide what you use it for too. Sometimes people will have coffee mugs in their you know, cupboards that they got from college or they got from a best friend and they have no intention of ever using it as its intended purpose of a coffee mug. So really evaluating those items and using them for their intended purpose. I use a lot of coffee mugs as pencil holders um, or I'll have it as a decoration item on my desk because I don't want, you know, this cute, adorable mug with the gold and everything on it to go through the dishwasher every single day. I just want to kind of look at it because it makes me happy. So identifying those items and putting them in another place, not just necessarily just what it's meant to be. Great, great advice. Um, is there, do you have specific tips? Now, the holidays for a lot of us are gonna look very different this year. Um, do you have specific tips on getting the, the kitchen ready for the holidays? Yeah, so my best tip for the holidays is to have your pantry ready. So probably not this particular holiday season, but in you know previous and hopefully where we'll get there by next year, holiday seasons. If you have people staying at your house, you want them to feel comfortable and you want them to be able to go and grab something to eat and not feel uncomfortable. And if they're walking into a pantry that's literally falling out at them or they get so overwhelmed, they walk out, it's not as guest friendly. So I always say, keep the pantry as set up as friendly as possible for a stranger to walk in off the street and be able to go in there and quickly identify what you have on hand, whether it's going to the chips or going to a protein shake, whatever it may be, make it as user-friendly as possible. Um, and then the other thing I'm a huge fan about, which is really, really hard, um, especially when you're busy and life is crazy and a lot of us are working from home and kids are going to school from home, the kitchen's the hub of the house, so a lot of paper accumulates in the kitchen. So a really good habit to get into is rather than getting the mail and bringing it into the kitchen and keeping the slow pile, is to go through the mail every single day, take 10 to 15 seconds and knock out anything that is trash or needs to be recycled. The majority of the mail, I, I think the percentage is something like insane, like 85% of the mail you get is generally not something you even wanna bring into your house and keep. So if you go through it super quick, you can just knock it out. And then if you have like a bill, put it in a to-do section. So this will give your countertops a nice, clean, open feeling and more inviting for guests too. Because the last thing you want is when guests come over and you have paper all sorted all over the place. Um, and you got your, you know, electric bill laying out and it's, you know, it's a little awkward. So if you can get your countertops as clean as possible, the best. Excellent. Excellent. So, so what should we not do? What, what is, what is, what is the top thing? You mm -hmm. talked about the misconceptions before, but what have you seen when you're working with clients that you say, oh, no, 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 that, that's not, that shouldn't be part of the, the process. Yeah. So there's really two things. The first thing, and this is um, what people do in every single room 
is that they go to Target and they're, you know, browsing around and they see all the cute Chip and Joanna Gaines home products. And they're like, oh, I'm going to get organized. So they get all these adorable products. They put them into their cart. They bring them home and they start to get organized by what they bought versus what they need. Then they end up with a bunch of containers that they never, ever need. So my number one piece of advice is don't shop until you've already categorized, you've already discarded, um, donated, gotten rid of all of the excess fluff, and then buy containers for your specific needs. So measure, um, you know, if it's a container for your cereal, you're getting that specific container and not just getting a bunch of random different size containers that you're trying to make work and they may not. So that's the number one thing. I see that happen a lot and it's really hard. I mean, I'm even guilty of it too because it's there's Chip and Joanna Gaines, for example, their stuff is so darn cute. You do find yourself going to the store and be like, oh, I need that, but you really don't. So just never shop before you organize. Um, and the other thing is looking at the entire space. People often will just get so overwhelmed. So really break down every single space, no matter what it is, even the bathroom, um, break it down to drawers versus cabinets versus shower. And anyone can accomplish small tasks, but a lot of people will get overwhelmed quickly with the huge daunting task of a closet or a huge space like the kitchen. That is absolutely fantastic advice. I, I often find that like knowing what not to do can actually be, how to say, a more palatable starting place. Um, saying don't do this, you know, because some of us will do that. And you're right, the idea of figuring out what our system is. Everyone is unique in their system. And, you know, I love that idea of not creating, um, uh, how would I say, not uh, shopping products that, that don't suit your system. That's excellent, excellent advice. You're right. We all think there's going to be that, well, if I buy this, then I'll become organized. And it's like, no, it, it actually comes from inside. <laughs> it comes from inside the house, right? Uh, um, so if we were, so Kim, if you talked about the refrigerator being a really good project to start on, if today um, we said, you know what, I'm going to start that half hour today, I need to get my kitchen together. Um, besides that, that's a great half hour project. Do you have any other ones um, that are really palatable, shorter, shorter term projects like that? Yeah, I do. So in my book, it breaks it down to your entire house in seven weeks. And it's very small pieces that you can are attainable. And it's not something that is like climbing Mount Everest in one evening. Um, so it breaks down the section of your house versus, uh, you know, family area, living space to your personal space, which is the bedroom to your storage spaces. And those are usually the ones that are the big monsters like the basements or the garages where you kind of just shove everything you don't know what to do with. So if you really take one week, knock down a room, the very small spaces and keep your Saturday mornings open for maybe an hour or two, you can accomplish and have an entire organized home. No matter if you're living in a 400 square foot apartment or a 4,000 square foot home, it'll be across the board and give you the steps needed to get there. Excellent. Kim, thank you so much uh, for, for helping us get a little bit more organized today. Yes. Um, and if, if we want to know more about you and your book and so on, um, here we are, that we, yes. all of your info is right there. Yes. Um, Kim, thank you again for joining us. And uh, you've, thank you. I, I know you've inspired me and I think you've inspired all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, God, I feel I feel like I want to start now. Um, so our next uh, guest today is Natalie Sutteray, and she is going to uh, help us uh, put on, uh, apply makeup like a professional. This is what she does. Um, she's the award, the award winning author of Be Your Own Makeup Artist, and she's an international makeup artist. Uh, an educator based in Wiesbaden, Germany. She believes that makeup is for everyone. And she teaches people how to shop for the right products and how to apply them in a way that works with their skin type, skin tone, and their preferences. Her work focuses on teaching people to be smart consumers and eliminating all of the white noise that can lead to confusion and frustration. She specializes in uh, 
advice that is 100% uh, intentional and inclusive. So Natalie, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, David. I'm so thrilled to have you. <laughs> yes. Well, I took notes during your segment, so. Excellent. Style, style and makeup go hand in hand. They really do. Um, so, so Natalie, um, I know you're going to walk us through a lot of your your wonderful techniques, but I'm I'm curious, just off, off the top, um, what would you say is the biggest misconception about applying makeup? I think that there's a few things that are across the board. People have this idea of when you wear makeup, you look this one particular way. Like I wear makeup or you don't wear makeup and you're in these two separate categories. And depending on your perception that if you wear makeup, some people think it's the foundation with the lines and other people think it's just always, you know, glamorous eyeshadow. And I'm, I'm here to say makeup is for everyone, men and women. It's been around since humans have essentially been around. And it's another way that we wanna feel good and empowered about ourselves. So it's not a badge of honor to say, well, I don't wear makeup, but it's also a badge of honor to say, I'm not wearing makeup confidently. Confidently not wearing makeup is a choice too. And so I think once people get past the idea of what is makeup and understand that wearing makeup could just mean a little bit of blush and mascara. Wearing makeup could be a full glam face. Wearing makeup could mean just some lipstick and maybe doing your eyebrows. There isn't a one size fits all makeup. And so I think people get a little bit intimidated when they're working with a makeup artist because they're scared. I'm sure you have experience with this too. People get scared, they don't know what's gonna happen. Interesting, very interesting. Um, so would you walk us through some of your wonderful techniques? Yeah, so I, I did prepare a little slideshow, but really I'm open to questions. You can write them out in the chat. But one of the biggest things I see a lot of my clients and people I teach, my students, is the first thing that they do wrong is they shop for skincare based on what it says on the bottle that it's going to do versus their actual skin type. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to talk about complexion. That is the complexion. And then also we'll talk a little bit about colors. You did a really great job. And so I'll go in more in the makeup, ask how we think as makeup artists into color. We can go to the next slide. So this is one thing I talk about a lot so much. So I have a blog post on it, but a lot of people, um, and women especially think of, they don't think of skincare and skin prep. So your skincare is something that you're doing every single day, just like brushing your teeth. This is for men and women. This is for everyone. You need to be taking care of your skin and it needs to be normally twice a day in the morning and in the evening. And this is not just buying products. It's also your diet and aging, water genetics have a, a role. And there's, um, it can get really overwhelming. Caroline, I have this book. It's a great resource. Caroline Heron wrote this book. Um, it's super easy to read and understand. And if you wanna really learn skincare from a very basic, um, she'll tell you kind of more about how, what products to use. Now, skin prep is preparing your skin for makeup. So that can change. You could have, it could be really humid outside. You could be a little bit hormonal. As women, it never goes away. There's always hormones and it's always a little bit crazy. We could have, you know, not enough sleep, puffy eyes, and of course, stress is always something. So when we're thinking of our skincare, we're taking care of our skin, but before we put on makeup, we might need to adjust how we prepare our skin for makeup for how we want. So if we're gonna have a really long day, we're in Miami, it's gonna be hot all day. We're gonna have to prepare our skin differently than just, does that make sense? <laughs> um, so I like to, and I have a free guide if you wanna um, download that, the link's at the end. So you did such a great job, David, on color. So I'm not gonna get into color. You have an awesome book, but a lot of times 
um, if you're not into wearing a lot of makeup, especially if you're gonna be doing a digital Zoom call or holiday party, after you do your skincare, prepare your skin, this is when you're gonna use, if you need it, color correction. As we get older, color correction becomes a little bit more of a necessary evil. Um, and I like to do my color correction before I put on foundation. A lot of times we'll use like a green primer to neutralize redness. So if you're really red, or we'll use something like an apricot here, Oh, um, sometimes a yellow to neutralize the purple or the blues. So you don't need to buy this full palette. You would just need to buy, you know, the color that you would want to correct. Um, so color correction is something I get asked about a lot. Learn your color wheel. Don't be scared. You can figure it out. And then foundation. As we're moving into the winter, I think of foundation as something that you should feel happy if you know, not all foundations are created equal. You can get a really nice, you know, water-based, full of water, really nice and glowy and dewy, as long as it's formulated for your skin type. You can use a powder, which is gonna be a little bit, you know, um, heavy, and it's gonna be oil, uh, neutralizing oils, great for oily skin, great for television and commercial. Um, and then you have cream foundations as well. Um, I have my little palette here and knowing your undertone is really important. So if you don't know that you're either going to be, you're going to be either warm or cool, but you can be yellow, you can be more olive, you can be more pink, you can be, you know, even blue and red. So knowing your undertone is really, really important to your foundation. And Fortunately, with technology, there's so many good places where you can go and actually get a true color match. Um, and then you cannot wear foundation without putting a little bit of blush or bronzer. You know, you need to bring that life back to your face. And I see that a lot, is that women tend to spend all this money on foundation. They want this ultra matte foundation, which can look really flat. And then they don't want to wear the blush because blush is scary or they're wearing the wrong color or they're wearing, you know, too much contouring just because that's what they're doing in YouTube. So we're going to not think about it that way. We're going to think about it adding life back to our face and strategically placing it. So these are just some, when you apply cool colors onto the cheek, it's going to be really dramatic effect and you want to make sure that your cool colors are in your color range but normally most you want to avoid the cool colors unless you're trying to make a statement the warm colors are more youthful and for signs of fertility and so we like to use warm colors warm shades of blushes and this is just a palette that can show you it's not just a pink you know, it's not just an orange. There are so many different shades of blush that are so flattering for all your skin tones. Just knowing your skin tone is how you're gonna determine that. You can pinch your cheek, you know, a few times and that's a good way to find out your true blush. And then um, avoid glitter. <laughs> it's not good for the environment. It's not good for your skin. There's really nice um, foil, there's really nice highlights that are more shimmery and less glittery, but especially as we get older, that glitter tends to just fall into the creases and we've all seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then with the eyeshadow, uh, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I'm talking so much, David. No, go, please continue, go through, keep going through and then, yeah, then we'll so, ask some questions, yeah. So um, with eyes, a lot of people go out and buy these big palettes and they spend tons of money on these types of palettes and they only use three colors. I love to build my own. Even as a professional makeup artist, I build a lot of my own palettes. But, you know, when you're shopping for a palette, try to make sure that it's balanced with mattes and also some shimmers. You want, you don't want a ton of shimmers, especially as we, as we get older, it's just not as flattering. We don't need as much. You know, sometimes we just need a little pop or just a little in the corner, maybe a little under our brow, um, or we can have some fun with it as a liner. So I love to play with eyeshadow finishes, but the big tip that I have is make sure if you're going to buy a, a palette that you have a nice balance between matte and shimmers. 
again, glitter as we get older is just, eh, it, it can fall into places. So make sure if you're gonna use glitter for holiday to use a type of glitter glue and so that it won't fall out into the eye or anything. And one other thing that I love to do, if you are scared of color, if you're scared of say this purple color or this blue right here, instead of making that one of your eyeshadows, try using it as an eyeliner and you can get, there's so many different products. This is called Duraline, it's from Inglot. It's great for turning your powder into a liner and you can have fun with color that way. And with David's tips, you could find your, your I, have to, I took all the notes, but you have to find your, your color and then you can, you can have a lot of fun with that. And then of course, colored mascara. It's, it can be so subtle and it can be so fun just to change it up. You know, you can do it if you have brown eyes or really deep plum purple. People are like, what did you do differently? And you're like, purple mascara. It doesn't look as crazy as you think. And lips. So cool versus warm, kind of the same as with blush, except for if you are more cool toned, you can get away with a cooler colored lipstick better than if you had warm skin. So if you had a cool skin tone and you wear a cool lipstick, it'll look pretty flattering. A uh, warm skin with a cool lipstick is gonna look really dramatic and vice versa. So if you wanna do that, go for it. It's all expression. It's what makes you feel good. It's not, there's no rules. Um, play with the finishes. You can just take your lipstick that you're wearing and you know, put a different finished lipstick on top, mix it, put a different gloss. Maybe it has some glitter or iridescence. You don't have to buy a ton of things, just mix and match with what you have. And the next slide. <laughs> yeah, so these are, um, I have a skin type guide. If you don't know your skin type, which I believe is the true foundation, because if you have oily skin and you are wearing silicone-based foundation or you are using um, cleansers that aren't formulated for dry, uh, for dry skin, or if you have oily skin and you're using the wrong types of foundations and it's gonna ruin everything. Your skin, your makeup's just never gonna look right or feel right. You're always gonna be like, I'm doing something wrong. And it's probably because you're not buying the right formula. And the good news is that at every budget, you can find great quality products for every skin type. I chat a little bit about this on my podcast. And of course I have my book, which is for beginners or for people who really just wanna reset their makeup game and just back to basics. It's, it's not an advanced book. And that's all I have. I think there's- so, so Natalie, this is, this is how we will follow you. Um, I love your, uh, your quote, adding life back to your face. That is absolutely a great way to think about makeup. I'm curious that during this period that we're in right now, um, this pandemic, you know, a lot of our lives, uh, well, all of our lives now when we are public is masked. Um, might this be a time to, I don't know, try something new out with our eye makeup? <laughs> For sure. Are you, are you seeing people like, look at that a little bit more during this time? For sure. And I, mask me is a real thing. So if you're going to be wearing your masks, I would avoid, I would avoid a ton of makeup there, especially if you're wearing a mask for a prolonged time. But this is a great time to, if you're a newbie, you can get a clear brow gel and just comb your brows if you have dark brows, or you can get a tinted brow gel. You know, if you need a little bit more pigment, I love these because they're so easy. You don't need a brush, they're foolproof. Um, you can get different tinted brow gels and frame your face if you need to. Um, but yeah, eyeliner, mascara, a pretty, you know, pop of color that if you weren't already doing that, a lot of, a lot of women have these palettes, but they don't wanna use that crazy color and this is the perfect time to do that, is to just experiment, try with a little pop in the center, try with lining, maybe the underline, like nice and thin, or even just a nice little highlight in the corner. Um, I, I think this is a great time to experiment with eye makeup and start small, take baby steps 
and you can work your way and get more confident with what you, and colors, there's no rules. There are rules of thumb if you are looking for a very specific kind of textbook look, but I think it's also self-expression. So I think it's okay to play with color sometimes, especially if your wardrobe is on point. So, so my other question to you is, um, is there a technique that you might share with us on applying eye makeup? Um, yeah, I know one, you have. I know you have lots of different te techniques. So on there's makeup. one thing that I love to show people. It's so basic and easy and elementary, and almost every makeup artist. Let me grab the palette. Um, one of my favorite techniques that will instantly, there's this two, I'll show you really quickly. So I have, this is just a pure matte palette. I use this because I have so many different, a broad range that I'll use. But a lot of times it can be your bronzer. If, if your bronzer doesn't have any highlight or shimmer, you can use your bronzer. And one of the things that I really like to do is contour the eye. So I'll find, you know, my shadow color, that goes in the crease. Sometimes I like to mix it. And when, and I'm blind without my glasses, so I'm gonna do my best. Wait, yeah, now I have a little mirror. One of the things that I will do is just, and I did it already a little bit, so I'm gonna do it a little darker here, is I like to contour my eye. And it, what it's gonna do is it's gonna actually just give that dimension. Think of a painter. When they're painting something, they are shading the eye to give it dimension, right? And so when you contour your eye, no matter what your eye shape is, it's gonna instantly open and brighten. And you're just gonna find where that crease is. And because it's a matte color, you can't really mess up. You can just blend it in. And I'll, um, I don't know if you can see it because the lighting does matter. Oh, we can, we definitely can. Can I see it? And then another thing that I love to do is you can use either a white or a flesh toned and you can apply this in your waterline and it's gonna extend the white of your eye which is gonna make your eyes appear bigger. So I'll do the white because you'll see it a little bit better on the video and let's see. And it feels weird if you haven't done it before. Let me warm it up a little, okay. And so I'm just kind of gently, gently, because you don't wanna make all the capillaries here flare up. And you just want to, let's see. Do you guys see? Yes, oh wow. And how much I have brighter? Never, I have never heard of that before. Really? A great tip. I love it. And if you really want to make your, I mean, we can talk for hours about it. I know I have a, a short amount of time, but really lining the tight line, which is the line right underneath your, where your mascara goes, that you kind of have to lift up your eyelid, lining that in a black or a really dark brown is just gorgeous. But those are just some really quick ways to brighten your eyes in a pinch. And always, I'm a three coats of mascara girl. Make that mascara work for you because, and it's always three coats with me. So three the charm. Yeah. Um, so Natalie, I have I have another question, and that is, um, you know, during this this period right now, with with so many people, you know, living their lives on Zoom like we are right now. Um, do you have any, you know, and, and I think a lot of people who used to wear full face makeup are now saying, well, I'm not really feeling that is necessary at that moment. And some still are. Um, but for those that say, you know, I still want to wear something, you know, I'm checking in with family and friends and my coworkers. Um, what would you say would be a good, um, how would I say, a, a good pandemic face to, to think about? So a really good pandemic face would be, and it really depends on the areas of your face that you are either the most self-conscious of or the features that you love the most that you want to highlight. But for me personally, either I'm going to brighten my eyes 
and use some mascara. So I might use a little bit of concealer underneath the eyes and brighten them, a couple good coats of mascara. Um, but definitely when we're on these Zoom calls, you need some sort of color on the, on the lips and the cheek. Um, and those are, the, those are the three things. You don't always need to have a full face. A lot of times the lights are gonna blur out those imperfections, of course, if you wanna spot conceal. But I did really quickly wanna show you what I mean about what you look like without lipstick. And of course my lips are gonna be a little stained. I just am gonna take off my lipstick and you're gonna see how on camera it's not, it, you know, I was wearing a pretty intense color, but a, a lipstick can really add a nice pop and it's very easy and everybody can go grab a lipstick that they love and it's, look it's a lot. Fascinating. I'm sorry, it's fascinating to see how the balance uh, of the face changes completely. Mm -hmm without Lipstick. that little bit of pop. Yeah, it's it's it really is a very powerful element of the face, definitely. Right. Yeah. Uh, Natalie, you have been such a delight and we thank you for your fabulous tips. We showed earlier how to contact you and um, thank you for helping us, quote unquote, your quote, um, add life back to our faces. We appreciate it. Thank you so it. much, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Me. Take care. So now, now that we've gotten organized, we know what to wear to a special occasion and we know how to apply makeup, I think it's time to think about our mind-body connection. And we have the perfect person to help us with that today. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Michelle Pritchard danced professionally in New York City and Los Angeles for 10 years before receiving her MFA in dance from California State University, uh, uh, State California California State University, Long Beach. Uh, she has taught dance as an adjunct professor at SUNY Brockport, Orange Coast Community College, Loyola Marymount University, and currently teaches in the dance department at Nazareth College. Uh, Michelle has performed with Keith Johnson Dancers, the LA Contemporary Dance Company, uh, Doug Verone in the Metropolitan Opera's production of Les Troyennes, and David Parsons in the Times Square Millennium Celebration. She was nominated for a Lester Horton Award for her performance with Keith Johnson in 2006. Michelle first discovered Pilates in New York City and went on to study with Carrie Clippinger, Rail uh, Izakowitz, and Bazi Pilates. She opened Evolution Pilates Studio in Pittsburgh, New York in 2008 and has been working with, there with clients of all fitness levels and backgrounds for the past 12 years. She's developed a curriculum for training dancers in Pilates for dance and hosts a private training program each summer at her studio. Michelle, welcome. Hello, thank you. We are so happy to have you with us and you are so accomplished in your field. Um, I know that uh, most of us know what Pilates is, but I'm wondering for those that don't, if you would give us a, a quick capsulized version of that. Absolutely, yeah. You know, we've, we've probably all heard of Pilates, but may not have experienced it. Um, Joseph Pilates was actually the uh, creator of the Pilates method. He uh, developed it in the early part of the 20th century. And um, he was a, uh, a fitness guru and an inventor. He, he created all these beautiful machines you can see behind me in my studio. And he created this method and um, it's a physical practice, right? It's low impact exercises. Um, but it's a lot more than that too. And I wanna to talk about some of the different parts of Pilates that I really love today. So, um, you know, Pilates specifically teaches uh, awareness of our breath. It teaches, um, it teaches uh, alignment of our spine and it teaches strength for these four postural muscles, right? The muscles that support us in our everyday movement and in um, basic stability and balance in the body. So um, 
you know, people who practice Pilates claim that it helps them just feel better overall, that they're able to do all the things they love to do with more ease and efficiency. So, you know, that's, that's a big claim, but, but I'll tell you that that is true for my body. Um, and I think that, you know, I've been practicing for many years and um, a couple other pieces of Pilates have become really important to me. And I think during this pandemic, um, these are a couple of things I'd like to highlight. So um, first is this idea that, that Pilates can be, um, you know, a, a way to become more aware of our posture. You know, our moms may have told us like, sit up straight. Um, turns out that there's a lot of uh, science behind what mom used to say, right? That um, we think about our posture today and how it's, how it's changed in modern times. You know, we're, we're, we tend to slump forward. Maybe we're on screens and on devices. So we get this like rounded shoulder forward head um, kind of posture. And, you know, you can imagine the constriction for your breath, for your heart, your organs, um, that it's harder for blood to, to move around in the body when we're in this position, not to mention the pain we may feel in, in our neck. Um, so, so thinking about your posture can really, you know, give you a lot of health benefits. And just for a second, you know, I wanna try a few things with you today too. Um, Everyone who's, who's with us, if you can do this, um, you know, sink into the posture you have right now. Don't try to be in your best version, but, but dig into this posture that you might be inhabiting, right? And just notice your breath and notice, you know, where you have sensation in your body. Okay. And now sit up and find your best posture. See if you can elongate your spine. Let your shoulders just fall away from your ears. Maybe notice how your skull is, is resting on top of your spine, how your rib cage is resting on top of your pelvis. And notice if there's a change in your breath. Notice if there's a little more ease in, in the body for you, right? So as simple as that is, just remembering to sit up and allow the body to elongate can, um, can really help us, you know, just function ease, more easily. Um, but there's, there's more to posture than that. I think too, the way that we present ourselves in the world, uh, you know, can, can be influenced by our posture. So say you have a really important interview or a conversation that you need to have, it's, it's important um, and you're nervous, you know, rightly so. And you need that, you need that adrenaline. But what is your body saying? You know, are you closed off? Are you nervous um, in the way that you're holding your, yourself? And how does that read to the person um, in front of you, you know, that do they perhaps think, oh, this, this person isn't ready, or um, this isn't sincere, or, um, you know, I feel fear. They may not recognize that uh, consciously, but subconsciously, we all take those cues from each other. So thinking about, you know, can I come into a situation with my best posture, so that I give myself the best chance at at really being open and empathetic and um, you know, showing that I'm ready for, for this task in front of me. So I think there's, there's a lot to posture. Um, and you know, another really beautiful piece of Pilates for me, um, you know, besides the physical, and we're gonna, we're gonna get to the physical practice of it, I'm gonna do some exercises with you, but it's this idea that um, Pilates is also a somatic practice. And if you haven't come in contact with that word, um, somatics, um, it describes you know, a lot of different practices. Um, Pilates is just one, but it really uh, describes practices that involve the mind and the body, right? How do our mind and body connect? How do they heal each other? Um, how are they both a part of how we're feeling? So, um, you know, Joe Pilates wrote 
a book called uh, Return to Life Through Contrology. He called this work Contrology because he understood this very early that the mind can control the body and the body can control the mind. So during this pandemic, you know, we're all feeling some anxiety, some stress probably on different levels. Um, and how does that land on our bodies? How does that live in our bodies? And what can we do to let go of some of that? You know, and that's, that's and, and I wanna acknowledge we have different levels of trauma around this pandemic. And, you know, of course, professional help when it's necessary is the best thing. But in the small ways that we can help ourselves, I think Pilates is a great tool um, for relieving stress. And I'm gonna show you how we do some of that. Um, so just to kind of demonstrate um, how the mind and body are connected, um, take a moment to try this with me. So it's a little weird and it's also a little triggering for some people. So if, it's, if it is triggering for you, absolutely back off and um, listen to your body, okay? But I wanna ask you all to clench your body with me a little bit, like tighten everything up, your shoulders, you know, whatever that means for you, but clench up, shorten your face and hug into the center of your body and, and let your, your face pucker. And let's take some like rapid breathing here. So just big, <laughs> let yourself get a little bit uncomfortable in your physical body. <sighs> it's almost over just for a little bit longer. <sighs> And at the same time, I want you to say these words in your head. I feel amazing. I feel calm and peaceful and wonderful. And let that go. Okay, let that go. It's awful. I know. <laughs> We're going to do the opposite. I want you to now open your chest, open your throat, maybe, you know, open your eyes, really spread the muscles of your face and relax them and take some big, deep breaths. And think these thoughts to yourself. I feel horrible. This is terrible. I'm full of anger and, and I'm upset and everything is, is just the worst. Okay, and let that go. So maybe you could feel how you didn't believe yourself, how there was a weird disconnect, a weird, you know, uh, 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 my body didn't understand, you know, um, because it is connected for us, our body and our, our um, nervous system is very connected to uh, what we're thinking about. So, you know, using that as a premise, as a base for this uh, work, we can go the other way too. We can use our body to help our mind feel better. So during this pandemic, this is what I've been doing a ton. I've just been um, in my body to try to relieve the anxiety of the moment. Um, so, uh, I think I'll go into a little physical practice now, if that sounds good. Excellent, um, excellent. Okay. And I just wanna say the exercise you just had us do, how eye-opening and yet how simple. So thank you for that. Yeah, it, it, it's funny because I've practiced that so many times that I'm getting better at talking myself into that they both work, but they really don't. <laughs> no, really don't. no, not at all. <laughs> I feel that, especially the first time. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to this table and I'm gonna bring, um, bring you with me. If, you're, if you have a place that you can lie down and do this practice with me, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, if you're in a chair and you wanna just watch, you can also do that. And I'll just say, again, anything that doesn't feel great in your body, um, you know, leave it. This, is, this should feel good. Um, and I'm going to do a, a little practice that's uh, accessible to all bodies and appropriate for all bodies. So um, it's safe for you, even if you've never done Pilates before. Um, so we're going to start lying on your back. And I want to take just a moment to settle. Right, so what what tension do we carry with us in the body that we might be able to release before we begin moving? 
And this practice of noticing is really uh, key to Pilates. We ask questions, you know, where are you feeling this? Where, where do you notice something? So let's do that for a moment. Let's notice what's present in the body. And you can close your eyes or open them, whatever feels the best for you, but just swim around in the body a little bit and see what's present today. And it might be, you know, sometimes when I ask people to look for sensation in the body, they look for pain. But what else is there, right? Are there other things in the body besides pain? Where, where do I feel comfort or ease? Where do I feel um, a texture or a color? in the body that I don't really have words for, right? So just spending a moment swimming around and what can I let go of? Where is there tension in the body that I can let go of? Physically, maybe also, you know, metaphorically, what can I let go of before I begin? So that we're working with an efficient body. It's not holding anything excessive. And I'm gonna start by just gently rocking the pelvis back and forth. So just a really easy rock back and forth. I press my low back into the table. I arch my low back away from the table or the floor. Just kind of loosening up, you know, a place that we all tend to hold some tension can, can be in our low backs. And just staying with that idea of sensation. What does this feel like? You know, what do I notice? Are my feet pressing into the mat? Is my skull rocking? You know, what sounds do I hear? so that we come away from our thinking body for a little while and into our feelings and sensing body. And so next, let's try a peel. We're gonna press the low back into the mat and peel the pelvis and spine up into a bridge. And if that's too much, you know, keep it smaller. And then can we roll back down through our spine? Can we move our spine you know, articulately like our hands. Can we peel up one segment at a time and then peel back down, finding mobility, looking for sensation. And try that one more time. You know, a lot of us are sitting a lot. So moving the spine can be such a gift to unwind some of that time spent sitting. All right, so let that go and let's take the right leg to this position called tabletop. I'm just gonna do two more exercises here. So I have this 90-90 angle and I'm gonna let my leg reach down to the table and back up. And it's simple, right? And what I'm really doing here, if we take hands on our pelvis, is I'm trying to to stabilize my center as I move my leg base, right? So you might feel movement under your hands. And if you do, make this movement of the leg smaller, quieter, until you can really feel those muscles of your, of your core, your center stabilizing the spine. And try setting that down and take the other leg. And just a few times, and it could be very different one side to the other. You know, it's quite often different one side to the other, but noticing that, right? Not going into a story about why, but just noticing and let that go. And then the last exercise I'll do here, just take arms down, see if both legs to tabletop feels okay to you. And if it does, we're gonna squeeze the legs together and take the legs gently from side to side. So again, this is about mobilizing our spines. You know, getting things moving where they might be stiff or stuck and recognizing the sensations present in the body as we do that. Where do I feel this? I feel this, you know, I feel my shoulders trying to help, so I'm gonna let them go. And I feel the muscles of my abdominals, my obliques, working to, to help support me. 
in this rotation. So just try that one more time each side. And then we'll set the feet down. And if you're on the floor or a mat, roll to one side, use your hands to come up. And we'll just do a couple of seated things that you could all do if you're seated, seated in a chair. Um, so take arms across the body and we'll sit up nice and tall in that best posture. And let's just take a little bit of rotation here. So spiraling the spine one direction and back and the other side and back. And then this can be really gentle, but just getting our bodies moving. And Pilates can be very hard, don't get me wrong, but it starts with some of this basic work to just get us moving, to get us aware of our bodies. And come back to center. Let your arms come down. Let your shoulders come up by your ears. And then exhale and soften. Let them fall down. And just feel any stress melting away with that. Inhale, raise the shoulders up. Exhale, let them come down. And rest. Okay, so these were just some really basic gentle exercises, but I hope that you feel um, a little energy in the body, a little bit less tension. Um, and if you have any questions, I can certainly um, answer them. So uh, Michelle, thank you so much. Um, I am curious to know about uh, just some of the long-term um, advantages of, of uh, Pilates. Yeah, so um, clients uh, that I've worked with have told me they feel um, greater sense of energy and length in the body, that they are able to do you know, their daily stuff easier, whether that's gardening or picking up children or um, professional dancing, um, whatever, their, whatever their thing is, becomes a lot easier. Um, people who have a lot of um, pain from their posture find a lot of relief once we find that muscular balance in the body. Um, someone just commented, I, I've heard 90 year olds still do Pilates. I have an 80 year old client um, and, and people of all fitness levels can do the work, which is a really beautiful thing. Um, yeah, so. I, my other question is, you know, I think for a lot of us, it's, um, you know, make what we're talking about earlier about like organization and so on. The the idea of committing to something um, is sometimes difficult. Um, how how would you say um, the easiest way to commit to a physical practice like Pilates? Um, what what would you say would be the easiest way to jump in? I think starting really um, small uh, can be the most successful because, you know, this happens to all of us. We're, we're so excited. January 1st, we're going to go to the gym. Um, we're going to, you know, make this year different. And, and it, new it's year, new year. All flat. Yeah, because that's a huge uh, goal. It's a huge amount of responsibility you're putting on yourselves. But if, you know, I move my body for five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, I increase to 15 to 20. Um, I can see and feel the results quicker and um, and I'm more likely to stick with it because it's not so overwhelming. Um, you know, we're, we have a YouTube channel where we're trying to put out, you know, little five minute, 10 minute clips so that you can just do something to move the body. And then we have fuller classes on our, on our virtual studio that you can also do an hour. Um, and, you know, so, but I think starting small is really important, especially Wonderful. if you're deconditioned, yeah. That's that's very good advice. And it's extraordinary to see just in the exercises you brought us through today, um, you know, the power of this mind body connection that you spoke about earlier, uh, um, because the minute you're, you know, saying one thing, doing something else to your body, it doesn't compute and vice versa. And then just the power of clenching your shoulders upward and letting go, you can't help but feel very, very different, not just physically, but emotionally as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of neuroscience and, um, you know, studies to back this up. There was a study in 2016 out of the University of Auckland that showed that our our posture really affects our stress level and people who, uh, you know, exhibited um, different, better, better postures were more able to tackle stressful tasks. So, you know, there is there is science behind this idea. Amazing. Yeah. Unbelievable. There's just so much to learn here. And thank you for, for giving us a taste of it. Um, and Michelle, how do we uh, follow you? Well, uh, we have a, a pretty new YouTube channel, but we're focused on putting more content on it with short video clips for you to just get you moving. And then we have a full virtual studio that you can do from anywhere in the world. Um, you can take classes with us live or on demand. So those are some great ways. Wow, amazing, amazing. Well, thank you so much for this today. Um, we so appreciate all that you do and educating us in, in Pilates. Thank, thank you for that. Um, so I also, I wanna thank all of my guests today um, for this edition of Feel Good Beauty. Uh, my name is David Zyla. And if you'd like to check out additional episodes, uh, please go to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a feel good, beautiful, beautiful day. Thanks.